Yes. But uh, one of the first things they, uh, I think Micah or somebody wanted to do was just uh, anybody. I, I, why? Why would you want to take uh, apologetics? Any comments? First what? Yes. So our oldest son is definitely not a strong believer. Yeah. It's a nice yeah. way of thinking. <laughs> and you know, when he kind of picks a fight, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know how to fight back. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can never find God through intellect, through reason. Uh, you know, Paul talks about three different kinds of people on the earth, okay? The natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. Uh, in the uh, exodus from Egypt, okay, remember they came from Egypt. Egypt is a type of this world. Pharaoh is a type of the devil. Uh, the taskmasters are a type of demons. And this, it, you know, the, the servitude they were under is a type of sin. Okay? And Moses against the law, God sent him in there to set God's people free. And, uh, and uh, but the a person who lives in Egypt is a person who's born of Adam, okay? The Bible says the first man Adam is a living soul, but the last man Adam is a life-giving spirit, okay? The Bible says the natural man, that's, the, the Greek is suke kos, because suke is, is your soul, okay? So Adam was a living soul, okay? Uh, and, and so the life he has is simply a soul life, okay? The Bible says the natural man understands not the things of God. He cannot know them because they're only spiritually discerned, okay? No one can know the thoughts or things of God without the spirit of God, okay? So a natural man trying to use his intellect, um, you know, may try to find God, but you can't, okay? Because it's only spiritually discerned. Jesus says, no one can come to me except that the Father first draw him. Okay? So to, we can't, you know, sort of argue our way and convert somebody. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Paul one time said, I didn't come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but with the Holy Ghost and with power. Okay? The words of God, like when Peter was still with the Holy Spirit, Literally, he said, became like a sword that pierced the hearts of the hearers, brought the conviction. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. You know, when the Holy Spirit hits you, uh, you don't, you don't have, I mean, it will do its job. That's what I'm saying, okay? Uh, so prayer is one thing you want to do. And uh, one thing, I'll, I'll just make a comment. Uh, about um, those that minister the gospel. Okay, there's a, on a little box up at the top. It's, it's the prerequisite to those that present the gospel. Okay, number one, he who ministers the gospel must himself be saved by the gospel. Okay, with the Spirit of Christ in him or her. Okay, uh, this is called apologetics class content. Okay. Up at the top, okay. So you know, I mean, it's like tell somebody how to ride a bike and you've ridden a bike before, you know. You know, but you know, so the person who ministers the gospel must have experienced salvation by the gospel. Does that make sense? Second, the primary tool of ministry of the gospel is the word of God. So a minister should be full of the word, okay. Uh, and Jesus said, the words that I speak, these aren't my words. I only say what I hear the Father say. You know, he said, of myself, I can do nothing. But can you imagine the Son of God saying, I can't do anything? I can't do any miracles. It's the Father in me that do, does these words. And the words that I speak, which I, I'll say when he spoke to the people, they marveled at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. And he thought, he said they were stunned his doctrine, because he did not teach like the Pharisees and the teachers of law. How did he teach? Okay? Since the words that he spoke, or his words, the 
Father speaking through him. Okay? And the word became just came to life. And people understood that and they recognized it. And so, you know, it, it touched their hearts. Okay. Now he, here's the difference. You know, you know what doctrines of men are, okay? We have something called denominations. A denomination is to take the body of Christ and and D means to split or separate, like depart, deport, stuff like that. Nomination means to give it a name. Okay, so you take the body of Christ, you chop it up into little pieces based on different doctrines, okay, which are doctrines of men that are void of any power whatsoever, okay? God watches over his word to perform it, but he's under no obligation to watch over anybody else's word. We are warned never to add or subtract from Scripture, okay? True Scripture brought and anointed by the Holy Ghost will change a life, okay? I used to be an atheist. I was a scientist. I was I knew science is the answer to every human ill. All right. Yeah. We were talking on the way home last time. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but right. when were you an atheist? When you were like from about eight, four years old? No, no, no. <laughs> Age 18 to 28. Okay, I was a scientist. I was chemist, physics, medicine, you know, and man, science was my God, you know. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I knew if there was any other problem in the human race, just bring it to the scientists mm -hmm. and they're going to solve it, okay? Now, the Bible says the God of this age hath blinded the eyes of those that believe not, lest they see the glorious light of the gospel. I never read the part where it says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. I didn't know I was a fool, but I was, <laughs> you know, yes. You just said about denominations. Yes. That was real interesting. So yeah. all, these all these breakup denominations that there are today, it was... A they took bits and pieces of the Bible and yep. made their own denomination exactly. to fit their lives. Well, some, but you have to understand. Remember, it said the natural man does not understand the things of God. Yeah. John the Baptist said a man can receive nothing except what he receives from above. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you, Paul was a teacher of the gospel. But where, where did he learn the gospel? He said, I was not taught the gospel by man, nor did I receive it from any man. I got it by revelation from Jesus Christ, okay? Now, let me tell you something. You know how you were supposed to get the gospel? By revelation from the Holy Spirit. Too many Christians have what you call second-hand understanding and knowledge of scriptures. I believe this because my pastor told me this is what's true, you know? But unless you're like a Berean and you go to the Word and listen to the Holy Spirit, Humble yourself to the word. Don't read into the word what you think it's going to say. Because then you're blind. You won't see it. Okay? You have to humble yourself to the word and say, Lord, in my humility, remember, the meek shall inherit the earth. Meek means teachable. Okay? You know, humility is everything in the kingdom. Okay? So when you go to the scriptures, we humble ourselves to the scripture and say, Lord, I'm like a little child. I don't know anything. Will you please, you know, if any man desires wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all in that regret, that was which, and it shall be given. You know, I'm going to say when I, um, I have a mother-in-law who was praying for me, you know, I'd see her down on her knees looking up in the sky, and I wonder, wonder who she's talking to, you know? <laughs> Nobody there. But, uh, but on the last week of November, 1979, uh, I was in the military and I went to Augusta, Georgia. It was in the second story of a motel room, pulled out the drawer on the <laughs> nightstand and found a Gideon Bible. I started reading the Sermon on the Mount. I'm telling you, bang, man, I, I got a revelation. And I knew what I knew what I knew. It was God. And I also absolutely knew that this word was God's word and it was true and it could be trusted. Okay. Now, where did I get that? From the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I didn't reason it out and start debating whether I'm going to believe this or not. No, that's not the way this works. That's interesting from a scientist to not yeah. question it. That's interesting. Yes. Yes, sir. So that, that's all great. Um, but that's a huge leap for someone who is not a believer, for them to have that revelation. I understand. How yep. do I yes. get the tools? Hey, let, me, let me finish. Yep. Get the tools. Yeah. And and the knowledge so I can have that conversation, yeah. right? And not and not 
Right. Not in that angry, beat person oh, no, over the no, head. No, never, never, never. I, I heard what you said about your son. Love on your son. Yeah. Even as hard as it is, love on him even harder. Yeah. Right? Because I've got the same son. Mm-hmm. Well, you right? cannot debate your way. You're right. You know. So so that's that's where I want to pivot yeah. your conversation. From what you're saying, yeah. it's very valuable to the how. Let me finish the, here, okay? Because everything is supernatural. That includes the ministry, okay? Like I said, they were astonished at Jesus, you know, the way he taught. Because he did not teach like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. How do they teach? They quote what Gamaliel or one of the rabbis said. What they, what they believed is that were only certain individuals that were qualified to interpret Scripture. And they had a word called Shmika, okay? And, and so, like, Paul was a student of Gamaliel, okay? Uh, and, and so everything Paul was taught was the doctrines of men, according to the Pharisees, and all this kind of stuff, okay? But he didn't know it, but he was blind as a bat. So it wasn't until his Damascus Road experience, he was struck blind, all right? And Ananias laid hands on him. The Bible says something like scales fell off of his eyes. Now, here's what's amazing. He went out immediately and began to preach that Jesus is the Christ. Where did he get it? From above. A man can receive nothing except what he receives from above. Okay? The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay, now let me just say this. So, you know, he who ministers the gospel must be born again by the gospel. Okay? Uh, you have to have Christ in you. This is what Paul said. You know, when he was taught the gospel, not by man, but by revelation. And he said... It was revealed to him, something he called a mystery hidden in ages past, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? And so when a person is born again, the Bible says we're born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the living and abiding word. I'm still going to answer your question. So just a minute. But so what if there's a corruptible seed and there's an incorruptible seed? Adam, the first Adam, is corrupted. So when you're born the first time, you got a wicked heart. You don't, may not know it, but you do. Okay. But, you know, when the incorruptible seed is Jesus, he's the word. Okay. All right. So we have to be born again, and then he lives in us. It is God that works within you, both to will and to do of his good purpose. Okay. So the person must be born again, got to be filled with the word. All right. And, uh, Receive Pentecostal anointing, okay? Since God can only use clean vessels, we need to live holy, okay? We need to live holy, okay? Now, a lot of people think, well, it's impossible to be holy in this life. But, you know, the Bible says, you know, in Hebrews, it says, endeavor endeavor to be at peace with all men and to pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You know, if you by the Spirit put the death and deeds in the flesh and you live. I mean, the gospel is what gives us power to, to live it. Okay. So since only God can say, the minister must believe that God will do what he says. Okay. So my job is simply to give the word out. Okay. It's God's job to make it work. Does that, my, does that make sense? Okay. I, I, can't, I can't make the word do anything. God can. Okay. All right. So, uh, but like I say, it is the goodness of God that leads men uh, to God, to God. Okay. All right. Leads men to repentance. Okay. Now, I'm just going to say that when, when I minister the gospel, I always pray. Okay. May I pray for you? You know, but now you approach people in a conversational way. Okay. Uh, you don't pin them down. And, and say, uh, have you been saved? You know, uh, they might say, from what? You know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we have to kind of lead into it. Hey, man, where are you from? And, you know, just a few questions here and there. Things will come to your mind. Things will come to your heart. At each time they say something, you're going to give them a little information, you know. Maybe, I don't know, having some problems at home, got a sickness or whatever. But I, I have noticed if, you know, after I kind of be, get friendly, be friendly, okay, 
uh, don't not nail somebody down or shove some gospel down their throat, okay? But I try to act like I care, I love them. I, I've got their interest in mind. I've got, you know what I'm saying? And and I always try to say, hey, do you mind if I pray with you? And I'm telling you, when you lay hands on somebody and just gently begin to pray, and the Holy Spirit begins to bring words <laughs> to your mouth, all the tears start coming down your eyes. Because the Holy Spirit begins to touch that person, okay? You can't save anybody. The living word is what saves. I think that as Christians, that's one of the biggest mistakes that we yeah. make is that we get triggered by somebody's questioning or somebody's challenge of whatever it may be. And I think that there's got to be some kind of um, composure to yeah. ourselves as to how we handle it. And we don't necessarily need to have the answer or give an answer at that right. moment. And like you were saying, it's more about building a relationship yes. and reflecting truly what the gospel is all about so that we can have that interjection yes. and, yes. and communicate at the time right. that God is wanting us to do so and not necessarily yes. at the time that we feel that we yes. need to do so. Yeah. Uh, again, of myself, I can do nothing. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Who's invited to a Bible study? Yes, sir. And... Uh, I've been touched by the Holy Spirit. I know I have. Yes. And they were just quoting the Bible, you know. You know. And I just got fed up. And I just get up there and I start talking. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what the Holy Spirit is telling me to talk. Yeah. And later, the minister walks up to me and says, uh, here's the Bible. You need to read this and quote the scripture before you talk. Yeah. I went, no. What? Yeah. Um, you remember, uh, I'm trying to think of this guy's name. It was an ancient guy. I forgot his name. He lived several hundred years ago. But he said, preach the gospel every day. And if you have to, use words. Okay. We, you know, there are lots of ways to demonstrate the gospel. Okay. One is the love of God. Okay. One is his kindness. Okay. Uh, one is. I never use bad words, you know. Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, okay? Bible says, let your words be seasoned with grace. What's grace? What is grace? Grace, we all know that's the power of God, okay? But here's what grace is. Grace is power or ability that he gives me to replace my inability to be who he wants me to be and to do what he wants me to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that's what grace is. Okay. I can, but he can. Does that make sense? You know, and, and uh, if we realize that I, I can't do anything, okay, but I can ask God to, like my word, give me the right words to say. Uh, just, you know, be kind, just demonstrate the life of the gospel. <laughs> That's a story I heard one time about a Christian who got thrown into jail with a murderer. Bad guy, you know. And he was in there for day after day after day. And and uh, the, the, the minister several times would bring up the word and just talk to the man in a loving, kind way. Never, never judgmental. You know, what are you doing in here, man? What, what? You know, remember what Jesus said on the cross? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. See, if you're born of a corruptible seed, you cannot help but you being the sinner. That's who you are, okay? We need a new heart, okay? Does that make sense? And so anyway, this pastor in there would just day after day be very nice to the guy, always jump up, help him, be kind to him, share his food, you know, and... and, and Ask him several times, would you like to accept Jesus into your life? And the guy blew him off, blew him off. But one day the guy said, Well, what is Jesus like? And the man said, He's like me. And the man said, Well, he's like you. Yeah, I'd like to know him. I'd like to know him. You see, understand what I'm saying? You know, he's lived the gospel and yeah, touched that man. Okay. Make sense? So, um, all right. <laughs>
The greatest commandment. One time people asked Jesus, a lawyer walks up to Jesus and said, which is the greatest commandment? Remember that? Now, why do you do that? Because, you know, it's Ten Commandments, but here's the problem. The, the, you know, the commandments sometimes conflict with one another. For example, if you think the Sabbath day is the most important commandment, that's the greatest commandment, and you're walking down the road and somebody's mule fell into a hole, well, I can't go pick that mule out of there. I can't go help my neighbor because I've been working. Okay? So the Pharisees were just nuts because Jesus would do, he'd heal people on the Sabbath. He, he, was, not, he was always doing good things on the Sabbath. That just drove him nuts. So the lawyer comes and says, well, what's the greatest commandment? Because that's going to determine what are you going to do? You understand what I'm saying? So he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy soul and strength. And the second is like it, you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. From these two, you keep the whole law. Okay? It's all about love. Okay? What's the greatest love we can do? You know? It's to minister the gospel. The gospel. And that, that, that's what God wants. God so loved the world that he gave us only begotten son. Whosoever should believe in him should not perish. Yeah, I sometimes carry a coin around, like a silver or gold coin or something like that, and I ask, well, what do you suppose this thing's worth? You know, what, what's his, what's the value of this thing? The answer is going to be, well, probably whatever somebody's going to pay for it. Okay. Well, think about it for a second. Okay. What is the most valuable thing in the entire universe? It's whatever the highest price was paid, which happens to be. The blood of Jesus that was paid for a human soul. That is the highest possible price that anybody could possibly pay for anything. Okay? God loved, so loved the world. Okay? He gave his only begotten son. You know, there's a parable one time where Jesus gave a parable and he said about a king. You know, who wanted to settle his accounts. And he had one guy that owned him 10,000 talents, okay? Now, if it's, a, a, a talent's like 120 pounds. If it's gold, 120 pounds uh, 10, times 10,000 is millions and millions and millions of dollars, okay? An unpayable debt. But the man fell down in his face and said, oh, have mercy on me. Have, you know, be patient with me. And the king forgave him his debt. Okay, paid off. Then the guy goes down the road and runs into another guy that owes him 100 denarii. Okay, remember that? Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens. The guy falls down on his face. That's payment, or I'm going to throw you and your family in jail. The guy falls down and didn't do it. You know, I'm not going to accept it. I'm not going to forgive it. Then the king heard about it. Okay. Well, what's the difference between these two debts? See, sin to God is an absolutely unpayable debt. And all we have to do is fall down. See, you know what justice, mercy, and grace is? You ever think about that? What's justice? Justice is getting what you deserve. The soul that sins must die. The day that thou eatest thereof, and there's free of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. Okay? Now they first die spiritually. They were naked, afraid, hiding from this holy God. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't stand to be in his presence anymore. And God immediately slew two innocent animals, skinned them, and covered them with the skin of those animals, okay, so that they could come back into the presence of God. So God, he, instead of justice, just wiping them out right there, he allowed a substitute to pay the penalty and die in place of those human beings. That's mercy. So justice is get what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting a blessing way above and beyond the gift of mercy. Okay? See, the gospel, let me just explain something. <coughs> Why did God create? What is the creation all about? <clears throat> Why did God make the creation? I want to tell you, Abram's life is in a sense a living epistle of God's heart. 
The word Abram means exalted father. Okay? Abram didn't understand it at first, but God arranged for Abram literally to move out God's heart. And what God wants is a family. He wants kids. Okay? All right? And so his plan is to let us make man in our image. Now, that's in Genesis. Who's the us? Okay? Here's the us. Okay? In order to have um, a child, okay, put it this way, when God started with Adam, did he make 10,000 Adams, 100,000 Adams, or whatever? Just, he starts with one. God, the way God does things is just start with a seed. Okay? <laughs> Because Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the Bible says God made Adam and Eve in his likeness, created he them male and female in his likeness. But once they sinned, you see, then they beget sons and daughters after their likeness. Okay? So every single human being is corrupt, got a sinful nature. Okay? Now the Bible says God did that on purpose. He did it on purpose. Okay? So that he could show mercy. That's why he did it. Okay? Human beings are so arrogant. Sometimes we don't think we need a Savior. Because we measure ourselves by ourselves. We look around the room and say, I'm not as bad as that guy. I didn't do what they did. But let me, let's illustrate this for a second. If you lie to your daughter, she may not respect you, but she probably can't hurt you. If you lie to your wife, you might get a divorce. If you lie to a judge, probably going to go to jail. But what, what if you lie to God? Okay? See, God's standard is perfection. Because if we break the smallest stroke of the law, the Bible says we, we've broken the whole law. How many lies does it take to be a liar? The Bible says all liars are thrown into the lake of fire. I'm telling you, the soul who sins must die. Okay? And once the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring to our understanding the magnitude of sin. That this is against the Holy God. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Bible says he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay? <clears throat> we don't, unfortunately. <clears throat> I've seen people under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm telling you, they just, they just, on their faith, they just can't believe. Once God reveals the corruption, and they realize by the Holy Spirit, you know, who they really are. You know, they are absolutely torn apart that they, of what they've done, okay? But see, once again, a man can receive nothing except what he receives from God. It's, again, God's mercy. The Bible, when, remember when Cornelius and his family were saved over there? And Peter <clears throat> saw this sheep let down with a bunch of unclean animals on it. God told him, I want you to go preach to these people. You know, remember this? Okay. And he starts preaching to them. Now, they're Gentiles. Now, I have to remember, this is 10 years after Acts chapter 2. So far, everybody that had gotten saved was Jewish. All of them. They just thought, well, the gospel is for the, you know, for the Jews, not the Gentiles. But now here comes Cornelius, all right? And, and God clearly tells Peter to go preach to him. And while he's preaching the word, okay, all of a sudden the Holy Ghost comes down and they're convicted with sin. They begin to speak in other tongues as they're filled. They get delivered, who knows what, okay? But the Bible says the Jewish guys were shocked that God had granted repentance even to the Gentiles. The point being, repentance is granted by God because a man can have nothing except what he receives from heaven, okay? And, and this is, I mean, we did, I can't do anything, okay? But with God and faith in what God can do, I can do anything. Okay? Yeah. I have a question about that story with Cornelius. Yeah. 
And so the Cornelius, like the jailer, yeah. um, he, they got saved, but then their whole family got saved. Yes. How was that? Okay, because there's a promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy and thy <laughs> house shall be saved. Okay. Um, you know, repent. There, there's a when Joshua, what Joshua say? You know, choose ye this day whom you shall serve. Whether it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Okay. Now, this is the way God works. That the, the head of a household, okay, has spiritual authority over those that are under him, okay, in a family, okay? And and uh, you see that go both directions. I don't even remember the story about Achan. Remember Achan? Uh, when Joshua was going into the promised land, okay, uh, there was a little town called I, okay? Uh, and, and they were going to go attack this town, and um, the and but they the Jews got clobbered, okay, okay now and and Joshua fell on his face, okay, said Lord what happened, you know, and God said there's sin in the camp, and when there's sin present, remember what we talked about, you know we have to live holy, God, you know, He can do powerful things through people who obey Him. Remember, Health, soul, and strength will put his love for God. First John said, This is love with God, that we obey his command. Okay. And his commands are not burdensome. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, because I don't have to do it in the flesh. God gives me the strength and ability to do what he says. Okay. It is God that works with him to will and to do of his good purpose. Well, something strange happened. Achan, remember, I don't he, he took a Babylonian garment and the wedge of silver, hid it in his tent, you know, obviously his family knew about it. And, and God told Joshua <clears throat> to, to throw lots, cast lots. And you have to remember the, the Jewish people were divided up into, you know, there's 12 tribes, so it was tribe by tribe, then there were groups of thousands and groups of hundreds and groups of fifties and groups of tens. So each time, you know, there's a division, he's throwing lots. I'm going to say, it, maybe it took all day, you know, for casting lots here, casting lots there, and then bit by bit by bit by bit, narrowing it down. Now, why did he not do it then? Because he's trying to be a take and a chance to repent. But he never did. Finally, the lot fell on Achan. And Joshua said, you know, Say, say what you did. And what they did? They stoned them to death, took all their belongings, put them in a big pile, and burned them. But they refused to repent. Why does God say, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated? Oh my God. Does God hate people? What's going on? What? Here, you have to understand, this whole creation is so that you could get an invitation to be an eternal member of the family of God. All you have to do is reach out and take it. It's a gift, okay? But, you know, some people would rather serve their flesh, and they'll turn their back on God and trade away their inheritance for a pot of soup or sex or who knows what. But see, unfortunately, when, when we do not accept God's mercy, he has no choice but to bring justice. We choose. Yeah. So referencing the PowerPoint that we were provided yeah. um, in that structure. Yeah, you want to go do some? Sorry, I got just, talking. Yeah, that. just wondering what okay. how we're following that. All right, yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, I, I get okay, carried away. Nice. I do rabbit trails all the time. So, uh, so anyway, we already talked about that. About you know, the person who ministers the gospel must be saved by the gospel. We live in holiness, etc. Okay, we already talked about the greatest commandment and to love thy neighbor as thyself. God, I mean, if you want to make God happy, go out and preach the gospel. Okay, because he wants kids. 
All right. Now, I'm going to kind of explain, you know, angels in the Old Testament were all called sons of God. Okay. Now, what's a son of God? A son of God is a creature, meaning he was created, okay, but not through sexual procreation. Does that make sense? It was a boom, God creator. Does that make sense? So they're son of God, not son of man or whatever else, okay? Angels are created perfect, but you know what? They had a choice. This is the way God does it this way. Every single creature in heaven, earth, everywhere must make a choice. But you know, God could just make robots to work, bow down and worship him and love him and, you know, tell them, oh, we just think you're great. But you know what? Love always requires a choice. All right, choose be this day who you shall serve. The angels, some of the a third of the angels followed those terms. Okay. And hell was created for Satan and his angels. Not for mankind. Not for mankind. Okay. All right. But see, then mankind, on the other hand, all of mankind has a sin nature. But God, you know, through the work of the Holy Spirit will show people their sinful status and bring in an attempt to deal with people, okay, to get them to make a choice to follow God. Like I said, it's, it's free. Okay, yeah. So if angels were created perfect, how yeah. did they still have a choice to make? Because thou was what God told in, in Isaiah, he, we speaking of Lucifer, okay, mm -hmm. he said thou was perfect until iniquity was found in thee. Okay? So in other words, but here's what happened. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God. How did the devil tempt Eve? You can be like God. You can make your own decision. You can sit on the throne. Okay? The, the, the Bible, it, it first, in First John, it talks about lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Well, Eve saw, she looked, she saw, it was beautiful, she decided, man, I can be like God, and she took it, all right? She made her decision. Does that make sense? All right. Yes, ma'am. Who created the devil? God did. So he created the devil. Yes, he did. Evil. He did. It's in Isaiah chapter 45, okay? Um. If anybody sees oh, it. I have another question. Yeah. So he made all these angels in the Old Testament to be sons of God. Yeah. And yeah. they made a choice yeah. to stay or to leave. Right. Why did they decide to leave? Because they were tempted by the devil. Because the you devil, can run your own show. Okay. Just kind of like he did Adam and Eve. Yeah. Okay. Does God still make angels? Uh, he sure does. Yeah. And they all have choices too. Well, yeah, but at some point in, in the future, here's what happens. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, I, some of these things that I'm saying, remember what I said, the doctrines of men? You know, there's all kinds of false doctrines out there. There's so many. Here's how I got into it, okay? When, when I got born again, I mean, I had such a, I had such a desire to read the Word of God. I mean, day and night, I read the Word of God. But I also read books and books and books and books about the Bible. And the more books I read, the more confused I get. Because just everybody's got a different opinion, okay? And, and what I started to do, I just kind of chucked the commentaries, the books. Yeah, the Bible says, you have an unction from the Holy One. You have no need that any man should teach you, but the Spirit himself will show you all things. Like Paul said, I wasn't taught the gospel by man, nor did I receive it from any man. I got it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You see, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. And if we humble ourselves, go to the Word, he, I'm telling you, David one time said, I know more than my teachers. Why? Because he said, you know, Psalm 46, I think it is, he says, I stir my heart with a noble thing as I quote my verses to the king. My tongue becomes the pen of a ready writer. 
As David meditated on the word day and night, the Spirit of God began to reveal that to him. The Bible says that God will write the word, the law, on our hearts, but it requires us to put it on Okay? And as David just meditated on the word, the Holy Ghost literally wrote that you know, word on his heart. What do you say? I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Now, when you know something by heart, you don't have to go look it up. Man, part of you. You know, and then when you have an opportunity to preach the gospel to somebody, just like Jesus says, these words are not my words. I'm going to say what I hear the Bible say. And I promise you, I promise you, when you open your mouth, it's going to come out and you say, well, I don't know where that came from. But that person that just listened to you, the Bible says that we are asked God. He said, there's a scripture that says, the Holy Ghost spoke through me. His words are my mouth. Another scripture says, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructive tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. <clears throat> he wakens me morning by morning to teach me as one being taught. Not been rebellious. You know, I'm telling you, when we turn our hearts to God, pay attention, get filled with the Spirit of God and the Word of God, I mean, you're going to, you know, you're going to move mountains. I'm serious, okay? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, okay? What did you just say that <laughs> those are the words that sustain the weary? That sustain the weary? Where is that? Uh, Somebody had to look that up. Okay. Uh, but it's, 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 there, there's a Google, you know, when you go yeah. to Google, you know that little yeah. microphone, you, 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 you hit that microphone. A lot of times I can remember a few words, but you just talk to that microphone and boom, you'll find it. Okay. So that's part of our great commission, right? Yes. Is to do that. So yes. where are we? Okay, now, so, okay. Now I'm gonna go on, like I said, God created evil, okay? But let me just point out, some people teach that, you know, the devil surprises God, jumps out in front of him, and God says, oh, you know, better go to plan B. What am I else going to do? I'm going to tell you what, God is sovereign. The devil cannot even lift his little finger. But let me just explain something. God is the minister of blessing. You go to Deuteronomy 28, there's all kinds of curses described for disobedience. Obedience produces blessing. Disobedience produces cursing. The devil is the minister of the curse. All right, now, if you go out on your garage, okay, all right, and you climb around up there and you say, I wonder if this, you know, if I ask God to, Send down an angel to bear me up as I dash my foot against a stone. Okay? And, and so I jump off the roof, I break my leg, all right? And then I say, God, why did you do this? Now, wait a minute, God didn't do that. You did it. There is a law. Now, Paul says there's a, you know, there's a law of sin and death, and there's a law of the Spirit of God. Christ Jesus. There are spiritual laws. Remember, we said justice, mercy, grace. When I break God's law, justice requires that I pay the penalty. Unless I confess my sins and then the advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who plead on my behalf and not just forgive me of the sin, but to cleanse me from unrighteousness. Okay, now there's a very interesting parable in Matthew that says, agree with your adversary while you are on the way, lest your adversary bring you into court to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. And I tell you the truth, you will not get out till you pay the entire price. Now, wait a minute. What is this? Who is the adversary? Okay, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Okay, now here's, remember in the book of Genesis 3.15, and the serpent tempted Adam 
Well, first Eve, Eve was the one that was conceived. Okay. But what did God say to this serpent? On your belly, you're going to crawl all the days of your life, and you're going to eat of the dust. Well, what's the dust? The dust is what Adam was made out of. The dust represents the flesh. It represents the old man. It represents the sin nature. God decreed that the devil would have access to your flesh, to your sin nature. Okay? So when he tempts you and tempts you and tempts you, it's always the flesh that responds. Okay? The lust of the flesh, the pride, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and pride of the life. So the devil will tempt you and tempt you and tempt you, you know, to get you to break God's law. The second you do, he'll say, gotcha. And then, you know, what would the parable say? Agree with your adversary of while you're on the way. Where are you going? To court. Because you broke the law. And who's the judge? God. Now, so am I supposed to agree with the devil? If I broke the law, then I have to say, I'm guilty. So I have to agree with your adversary while you're on the way. Or you're going to get justice instead of mercy. So, but on the other hand, if I agree with the devil, I am guilty as I can be. Now, all of a sudden, my advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, when I get in front of the judge and I, I'm guilty, Jesus steps forward and says, I already paid for that. <laughs> all right? So instead of justice, I get mercy. Beyond that, I get grace. Where sin doth abound, what's the rest? Grace doth much more abound. Because he wants me clean. <laughs> I just have to humble myself, admit it. Is this making sense? Okay. But God, actually, the devil works for God. God allows the devil to test me and try me and refine me. But he says, after you've suffered a little while, he will make you strong, firm, steadfast. Refining fire causes me to trust in God. Thought, you know, and not in myself. Okay, you know, we must through much tribulation into the kingdom of God. Nobody gets to the promised land without going through the wilderness. The wilderness is where we get tests and trials and difficulties. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, you know, mankind are all corrupt. Jesus God made a strange statement in Genesis chapter 6. He says, my spirit will not always strive with man, but his days will be 120 years. What's that all about? Okay. There are different kinds of years in the picture. One of them is called a jubilee year. It's 50 years. Okay? If you take 120 times 50, you get 6,000 years. See, God has decreed his spirit, he said, my spirit will not always strive with man. What's he doing? He is reaching out. He's trying to touch our hearts. He's through every situation and circumstance. Sometimes he'll allow the devil to, to create all kinds of problems to me, you know, until I cry out to God. Okay? But it's, it's, it's his time. All things work together to good. For those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Never think for a second that God is not a good God. I mean, it's just not, can't be. It can't be. Okay? But he loves us enough. He will create situations and circumstances where I am just dead. Lord, if you're there, would you please help me? Reveal yourself to me. You know? There were two men, which Jesus told about, that went to the temple for prayer. One was a Pharisee who said, Lord, I thank God I'm not like this publican over here. I tithe mint to deal. I do this and that. I keep the law and on and on and on. Now, here's what's interesting. The Bible says he prayed thus to himself. In other words, his prayer didn't get any above the, didn't go anywhere. But this publican, Right out and beat his chest. 
right? And said, Lord, have mercy on me, a son. What did Jesus say? That one went away justified. See, he had a broken heart. A broken and contrite heart the Lord thou wilt not despise. Is this making sense? Yes. So it may be just me, and I'm learning a lot about some of the, 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 the uh, insights into some of the scripture, but I am not able to tie this back to apologetics, okay. which is, my understanding, is a reason for defense yeah. for the faith. Yeah. So, you know, I think okay, well, I have enough to start this pencil on the box. I don't know yeah. if anything, but I have trouble with it. Let me say this. Remember we talked about doctrines of men. We okay. need 5,000, no, whatever, 50,000 denominations. Okay, no. So, and, and these are just men's ideas, okay? We now, say these. We're, we're not, these doctrines the of men, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. that are not of God. Right. Okay, if that makes sense. They're not inspired by the Spirit of God. They're just, you know, they're powerless. That's what Jesus said. The doctrines of men are void of power, okay? Because God watches over his word, not somebody else's, okay? Now, so, you know, when I first, they asked me to do apologetics, I looked around, read this and that, and, you know, there, there are dictionaries of terms on apologetics. I mean, it's the most complicated gobbledygook, and I, I promise you, nobody in the, in the Bible would have the foggiest idea what all these terms mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I yeah. I gotta object that it's complicated. It shouldn't be. No. It shouldn't be. See, my, my opinion, yeah. right? I'm assuming you, you know a lot more than I do, but yeah. an apologetics conversation kind of goes something like this. You want to have a conversation about yeah. faith. I don't know all the answers, but we're right. kind of running together. And you want to leave that person, but you know that feeling when someone sticks up. Yeah. A stone in your shoe and you're walking going, hmm, that right. feels a little weird. Yeah. It, it just causes that conversation to continue. I agree. So what no, no, but you just you just said apologetics. No, was what I said was he, what what apologetics, when you go get lots of seminaries, uh, Bible yeah. schools teach apologetics. But if you look at their dictionary of terms, basically what they're arguing is various doctrines of man. I'm just saying. Okay. Now, let's. My definition of apologetics is this: find to uh, give, or you know, uh, to define the gospel, to minister the gospel, explain the gospel, and defend the gospel. That's that's simple. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm just saying it doesn't require. Anything complicated at all. I only say that sometimes people complicate it because <laughs> with all these denominations, some people are, will say one saved, always saved. Some people will talk about Calvinism, which means the, the predestined. God calls us, we are predestined to glory, predestined uh, to justification. Okay? And some people, Turn that into something saying God before time began decided certain people are going to get saved and others aren't. Now there's a large body of people out there that teach that. Okay. So so by your definition, it, it, it agrees with what's what you written here. Yeah. Can we so, steer the conversation that way? Yeah. Okay. Okay. What is predestination? If there's two buses outside, one's going to New York and one's going to LA, okay, one's Jesus, one's the devil. Whatever bus you get on, you are predestined to go there. Bus goes, okay? The Bible says, Jesus one time made a statement. He says, nobody goes to heaven except he who comes down from heaven. If we are in Christ, we go wherever he goes, okay? Because all of the blessings of God are in him, okay? Now, <clears throat> almost, I will say, Rightly guided in a conversation, every human being should be able to understand that they've got this sin nature. Okay, all right, and uh, the the you know first we have to get people to figure out they need a savior. They are sinners. Okay, that God has already made provision to forgive sin. Okay, and <clears throat> there's only one way. He said, "I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me." Okay. 
Uh, so, um, <clears throat> and it's as simple as receiving the gift that God offers. Okay, and and uh, once again, instead of justice, God offers mercy. But if I say, you know, I'm going to give a hundred dollars or whatever, that'll reach out to me. You know, faith is your concrete required. Okay, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because <laughs> it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Okay. And, and uh, faith is a gift, okay? Just like repentance is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of worth, as any man should boast. Okay. Now, I understand we have this tendency that we want to straighten people out or, you know, somehow, uh, I mean, you know, <clears throat> I think any believer would love to be able to reason with people, do whatever it took to get other people to receive the gift of eternal life. Okay. Yes. So question nine on the yes. PowerPoint states, yes. Jesus commanded his disciples not to tell anyone yes. that he was the Christ. That's correct. Why? And so can you... Um, well, yeah. Okay. Well, what did, remember, now there's two testimonies of who he is, okay? Who do men say that I am? That's what Jesus first said, you know. And, and well, some John the Baptist from back from the dead, some a prophet of old, some Jeremiah, some, you know, whatever, okay? All right? But Jesus said, then, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus then said, blessed art thou, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood didn't show that to you. Remember I said that everything comes by revelation from God. Okay, all right. This is firsthand understanding and knowledge, not secondhand. Okay, he said, Blessed art thou, Simon of Barjota, for flesh and blood did not show that to thee. My Father who is in heaven. Okay, in First John, it says there are two ways to get a testimony of who he is one is the testimony of the Father, and the other is the testimony of men. But he said, The testimony of the Father is great. Okay. Because it's in your heart by the Spirit of God. Nobody will ever be able to talk you out of it. Okay? Everybody has got to get it that way. That's why he told them, don't go out and tell everybody I'm the Christ. Because he, he never designed this for people to just get the testimony of men. Okay? They have to be taught things and, and then, the, the, then this heart in this person begins to believe this and ask the testimony of the Father. So he said, don't go out and tell everybody I'm the Christ. Okay? Because he wants everybody to get it just like Peter did. Does that make sense? By revelation. By revelation. Okay? Ultimately, you, you can... John, John Wesley, everybody know who John Wesley is? Okay. John Wesley, back in the uh, 1700s or whatever, uh, he and his brother Charles... Uh, had a huge revival in England. I mean, literally, the bars closed down, the whole towns converted to Christ, and it was tremendous move of God. But John, John said this. He said the churches are full of people who have what he called mental assent to the truth of the gospel. Oh, yeah, Jesus died on the cross. He paid the penalty for sin. Okay. But it's all right there. Not okay. So he, what he was saying is, as a consequence, their lives aren't changed. They have no power over sin. They're in there putting a little mask on. I'm a good Christian, you know, trying to be something they're not. You understand what I'm saying? So you, yes, you're doing a great job explaining, in my opinion. You know, you, you got to have faith. Yes. You got to have an open heart. And nothing comes to us that comes from heaven. Yes. And I'm just imagining myself having a discussion, frankly, with myself yeah. or with anybody else yes. that may be on the verge. Uh, okay. And so what, I, what, what I'm looking for yeah. is, is, is to appeal maybe yes. first to the mind yes. to the scientist in that yes. person if you will yes. based you know, going on your experience the background 
to that and say, yeah. okay, it's not, it's not, there's some legitimate basis to this yes. that one can reasonably assume, yes, that seems to be real. And then from there, things grow. Yeah. So that's the key, that's the part that I'm still yeah. looking for, excuse me, in this class is, yes. is that aspect of it. Yes. Okay. So how do we defend it versus how do we, uh, versus argue? Well, you can ask, you know, if somebody says, well, maybe there's not. I think there's lots of ways. I mean, if you're a Buddhist or if you're a Hindu, what's wrong with them? You know, there are many pathways to God. You know, all yeah, so, right. so if somebody asked that question, yeah. that's, what, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. How do we defend it? Okay, yes. here's what you do. When, you know, what is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. So you say, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I've got a friend that would say, yeah, that's, that, why? Why is, why is Jesus be all end all. Why is everything have to go through G? I got you know, good friend of mine is still said that. I understand that. But once again, a, you can't debate salvation into somebody. I, uh, right. And that, that's, that's not right. for them. You speak the word. Remember what Paul, one time you know, in Romans, people were saying, Well, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Jesus. And Paul said, Wait a minute. Paul didn't die for your sins. You know, he said, One sows, another reaps. But it's God that gives the increase. What are they sowing? The word of God. Okay. Now, you know, there are many parables. There's one extremely important parable called the parable of the sower. Okay. And, and Jesus gave his parable. He said, the sower went out and he sowed seed. Some was on what's called the, the byway, which is, you know, on the road, going down the road, there's a, a footpath on the side with a the soil was kind of mashed down because it's had so much traffic. And he, and he said, some of it falls in that wayside. And the birds in the air come immediately and pick it up as well. Okay. Some of it falls where the soil is thin, you know, and it germinates, starts coming up. But when the heat of the day comes, it wilts and dies. Okay. And some falls in the bar ditch over there, okay, where the where it's starting. Starts coming up, but he said the, uh, the the weeds and the thorns choke it out, and it's not fruitful. Okay, some falls in good ground, and it produces after its kind 30, 60, 100 fold. I will explain this. Okay, Jesus asked the disciples asked Jesus, "Why are you teaching parables?" Okay, once again, you cannot get it intellectually. He said, "It is given to you to understand." The kingdom of God. But to them, talking about Pharisees and teachers of law, it is not given. They have eyes, but they can't see. So they basically, yeah. so basically you're saying that everybody's on their own path. No. You're simply trying to communicate some something yes. in regard to the gospel. And wherever that person's path is, they will receive whatever it is they're intended to receive, yes. and they will grow according to however. Yeah. It is intended for them to grow. The power is in the word. Okay. The disciple said some will die, some will live, some will continue to grow. And, 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 some... and, and you know, in all of us, all of us are some portion of that sure. so, at some time. Sure. You know, go to church and you're busy making a shopping list or something like that. The sure. pastor's, pastor's preaching a great sermon. And on the way out the door, one guy says, Man, did you hear that? Oh, that was so good. And you're like, you know, you were working on your shopping list, you know. Yeah. The devil came from me and yes. took away the word. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, so, the disciples, go ahead. So, kind of to add on to that, then it seems to me maybe what I envision of apologetics yeah. is different than what you're doing here. And I'm thinking, what I'm thinking now is what you're doing here is saying, make the reason defense is this. Tell Parents and tell the meaning behind them. Is you answer the questions. You know, like I said, they, you know, uh, what what is it that's being sowed? Jesus said, the disciples said, what does this parable mean? You're, Jesus said, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any parable? Okay. In other words, this one is key. Okay. So he said, the sower is the son of man. The seed is the word of God, and the soil are the hearts of men. What was Adam and Eve made out of? Dirt. 
dirt. Now, when you plant a garden and you throw some seed down there and it comes to fruition and grows up and it's harvest time, do you tan the dirt? No, the dirt is just there to nurture and grow the seed because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But the seed of the word of God is eternal, okay? We are born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. So what I'm saying is the word has power. Okay, now the, the Greek word for seed is sperma. Yeah. Remember we talked about that last week? You know, so the word of God, in the, you know, the word of God is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All right, now. What do we say? The whole darn thing is about God wanting a family. And the seed is the word of God. It is the sperm of the father. Okay? And when he sows it, okay, what did Mary say? You know, Angel Gabriel comes and says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. He's going to be called the Prince of Peace. He's going to sit on David's throne. And his kingdom will be forever. All right, on and on. And Mary said, well, how's that going to be since I know not a man? I read about the birds and the bees. Who's planting the seed, you know? But see, when Angel Gabriel gave this inspired word of God to Mary, that was the sperm. That was the word. What did she say? May it be unto me according to thy word. Okay, and then the father says, yeah. Well, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And therefore, that which is conceived in you should be called the Son of God. So the Father sends out the seed. Remember, one sows, another reaps. Some of it falls in good ground. I'm just saying, this, it's the Word of God. I, I can't add to it or take away from it. It's the Spirit of God that anoints the Word and causes it to bring fruit. Just like when Peter preached after he spilled the Holy Ghost. You know, and the Bible says that word went out like a sword and pierced the hearts of those that heard. Okay. And they cried out, what must we do to be saved? Okay. So the same thing is true for us. If I preach the seed of the word of God, okay, it's God's job to watch over his word to perform it. I, I, I'm going to pray to this person. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to love on him. Okay. But it's not going to do much good to debate them. It's just not. Okay? Because of myself, I can do nothing. Okay? Yes, sir. So I heard one apologetics from one time, and I think it's from PT Forsyth. And what he said, so someone approached him and said, how can you believe in God, you know, with all this war and sickness? And he said, if anything, that strengthens my belief in God, because how could you expect something else in a fallen world? Than this, and the first time I heard that, it like it rattled me. I was like, "Dang, yeah. like that's so true." And so, um, I think like that's kind of what I think of with the apologetics. It like shapes the heart and the mind at the same time. Yes, you know. Um, so like, how would we? Yes, and like you said earlier, <laughs> to know the words that sustain the weary, yes. and like that. I mean, that sounds like discernment to me. Yeah. It's like, let me hear from God how to do this. There but you go. Sometimes you go. it's not always um, like by it. So for me, for the longest time, it took me yeah. 21 years to receive the, the revelation of God. But, yeah. And I always heard about faith and spirit. It all just seemed cosmic. So like, how would you bring it down to a more... Yes palatable level okay. of where well, you're not trying to make it so now strange. let's talk about that evil in the world we talked about you know and, uh, remember when <laughs> satan was hit to the devil you know 40 days in the wilderness after jesus was thrilled with the holy ghost he went into the wilderness the bible said the holy ghost led him into the wilderness to be tempted with the devil that was god that sent him out there okay and so 40 days and 40 nights now there's three different temptations talk about it one of them it says that, that Satan led him up to a high place and showed him all the kings of the world in their glory and said, all this has been given unto me. It's the devil talking to me to do with as I will. Well, that's true. He's called the God of this age. He's the prince of the power of the air. When Adam and Eve, Adam was given dominion over the earth. 
but he lost it when he sinned and he bowed his knee to the devil. Devil, the devil now has dominion over the earth. Oh, uh, he says like Jacob and he saw like he sold his birthright. Ex yes, yes, exactly right. And see the devil, he, he will tempt all of us. Remember what it said? He has access to the dust, the flesh. When, you know, there's, it, it, Hebrews talks about this great chapter 11 of all this history of people that had victory by faith. Okay, it's called the faith chapter. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but what's interesting, then after chapter 11, it talks about that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. These are people that have gone on before us, that have won the battle. They've overcome, okay? But, you know, there's all these, that, oh, who is it that overcomes the world? Only who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world, okay? I'm an overcomer because the overcomer lives in me, okay? It's the grace of God that gives me the ability to say no to sin, okay? And and so, um, I forgot where I was going, you know? What was I talking about? Yeah. Um, I'm related, but yeah. um, just one of the questions on here is, what is Nicolaita? Nicolaita. In, in, okay, here, here's what Nicolaita is. Nicolaita is. Twice, this word or, or variation thereof is used in, in the book of Revelation. It says that Jesus hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Okay. Oh, what was that? Okay, now here's what it means. Nico means victory. You ever have a Nike tennis shoe or something like that? It means victory, okay, in the Greek. So Nicolaitan, you ever hear of the laity in the church? Okay. There's the clergy and the laity. Okay, now the doctrine of the Nicolaitans teaches, just like the Pharisees did, the laity cannot understand the scripture. You've got to listen to the clergy. They know what the scripture means. So whatever they tell you the scripture means, then that, that's what you've got to believe. Okay, now what did Jesus say about that? I hate that. Now why? Because... This is a one-on-one -on -one relationship that any single one of us can have with God. We do not need an intermediary. Jesus is the intermediary. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, okay? You know, I have an unction from the Holy One, and I have no need that any man should teach me. The Spirit himself has told me all things. See, I, I don't need to, you know... I promise you, if you spend some time studying the word, get down on your knees and pray for wisdom, you think God's going to show you things that will just blow your socks off. Yes. So what would you say to the person who claims to have received the Holy Spirit and been born again and interprets the scripture differently than yeah. you might? Okay. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many shall come in my name. Well, that's what Jesus, remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley, and there was, the, you know, uh, the temple mount over there. And the disciples said, man, Lord, isn't this Herod's temple, you know? Isn't this beautiful? Can you imagine how pretty that is? He says, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly, not even one stone is going to be left on another. It's all going to be torn down, all right? I'm sure, you know, they had to pick their jaws up, and, you know. And then they, they came and sat down to Jesus, and they gave three questions. <clears throat> when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the age? The first thing out of Jesus' mouth was, watch out that no one deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. I am anointed. I know what it's all, it's all about. You can trust me. But they're deceiving doctrines of demons so long, so often. Okay, uh, and the true word of God can only be revealed by the Holy Spirit. Now let me say this. But to her question, to her question, yes. How do you defend okay. the doctrine versus right. when right. you when you know right. that someone 
has got the wrong idea. Communicated okay. that they mm -hmm. have been or even like it's all it's all book How knowledge, do you... right? And no heart knowledge. Yeah, and they know more. So chapters you, and so, verses. <laughs> so you you're not arguing it. You're yeah. perhaps okay. defending it. Yeah. Let, let me and let so me just say you... that. Remember, we said Jesus one time said, "Every idle word." That thou shalt speak, thou shalt give account thereof at the day of judgment. For by thy words shalt thou be justified, by thy words shalt thou be condemned. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Okay. okay. James 3 said, you know, talking about the tongue is a rudder in your life. He said, just as a tiny little spark can set a whole forest on fire, so also the tongue can set the course of a whole person's life on fire. And the tongue itself is set on fire by hell. Now, here's what's words carry an anointing, either the spirit of truth or a spirit of deception. Okay. You have words, death and life, or the power of the tongue. Okay. Now, a false prophet does not know he's a false prophet because he's deceived. A false teacher does not know he's a false teacher. Because he's accepted doctrines of demons. They've formed a stronghold up here. All right. The Bible says, ye be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay. The word of God is alive. It's powerful. I, so, yes, so what I'm what I'm getting between yes. what you're saying, you, you said how do you what do you say, right? So in, in Luke when yeah. when Jesus is being tempted and the devil says, right. turn these rocks, and I'm not saying this correctly, <laughs> turn these rocks into bread, right? And Jesus arms himself with the, the scripture. He says, oh. you know, man shall not eat by bread alone by the soul of the word of God. Yeah. Okay. That's what we, I guess that's what we're charged to do. And, yes. I, and I, I'm probably horrible at it because I don't yeah. have that knowledge of understanding scripture well enough to yeah. be able to defend it. And, and I, so I personally related my, my other smart son, when I, when you argue with me, you know, he always throws something that I can't answer. Like he'll say, why does God hate homosexuals? And I say, look, I don't think he does. He loves I, I, I don't, I don't know that. I'm okay, and, and it's, but I can't answer that. But, but what I tell them is, here's what I know. God doesn't distinguish sin, you know, from stealing a piece of gum to something horrible that that everyone argues is is, is unforgivable. Sin is sin is sin. And what I tell them is, you have to, you just like me, have to work on righteousness. Yeah. which is a standard that, and, and right away he kind yeah, of goes, oh, I don't know. I, then all of a sudden, he doesn't know how to defend that. And I don't have to defend it anymore. Yeah. I just have to be able to tell him, I'm just as bad as you are, and we're working on this together. Yeah, a righteous, remember we talked about, we're born again, not a corruptible seed, but an incorruptible. Okay, let me point something out. The heart, remember the Bible says, God looks on the heart. Okay, now, what's that all about? The heart is your spirit. It's a combination of your spirit and your soul. That's what your heart is, okay? Uh, and, and that little, remember the tabernacle in the wilderness? Okay, it was covered with all those uh, animal skins, okay? The tabernacle has two compartments. It's called the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies, okay? The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That represents the spirit of man where the presence of God is. God lives in our spirit, man, okay? The Spirit himself bears witness within our spirit that we are the sons of God, okay? Now, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, okay? But they're very closely related, okay? All right? And there's only one thing that can divide asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word. The word of God is a lot powerful and sharper than any two of his sword. It's able to divide asunder, to separate soul and spirit. Okay, now, because that's what it says the thoughts, that's your soul, 
and the intense, that's your spirit. If you've got a corrupt spirit from Adam, you're corrupt. There there is no way you can do righteousness. You can't be righteous because the seed is bad. And every seed bears after its kind. The only thing you can do, this is what John the Baptist talked about. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Behold, the axe is already laid at the root. What's he talking about? Means this bad tree that's producing bad fruit in a person that has a corrupt seed, you got to chop that tree down. Yes. Didn't you say at the beginning of class yeah. that when you're ministering, you don't defend? Because if you have somebody spitting at you trying to defend, they're not going to get anywhere because you keep pushing back in the resistance. But that, that well, doesn't have to be an argument, though. I mean, no. that's kind of what. No, but that's, that's, I keep hearing the, in, the, in the classroom defend, defend, defend. How do I defend this? How do I defend that? And my question is is a better word to use other than defend? Well, remember the guy in life is with the Christian. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he's not defending anything. He's just demonstrating. You know, exactly. Preach the gospel every day. And if if you have to, use words. Okay? I mean, you know, your life will speak for itself. By their fruit, you shall know them. Okay, now there's fruit of the Spirit, there's gifts of the Spirit, and there are ministry offices of the Spirit. Okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. That is the personality, presence, and character of Christ in you. The well of water that wells up into eternal life. That's the mystery hidden in ages past. The surety of the covenant. The power of God who inseminates you with the living word. Okay? And, and it produces fruit. You know, what? You know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The branch, the branch that doesn't produce much fruit, God prunes so it'll be more fruitful. If you got a branch that doesn't produce any fruit, cut it off. Okay? Yes. So, let's just say every single one of us down here believe and know that like the power is in God's word. And that's how people are changed by revelation of God. Yes. How would I lead someone to God's word? Like, yes, I would pray for them, yeah. but what if, like, where does the rubber meet the road where I can yeah. at least lead them to the power of God like that? One, like you were, we talked about how, you know, the Holy Ghost spoke to me, this words in my mouth. First of all, we have to be born again. Paul said one time, examine yourselves that you be in the faith. Anyone that has not the spirit of Christ is none of his. Okay, people go to church, you know, they're just trying to live the life, but they don't have the power down there. Okay, and and so we each have to examine ourselves. Am I there? You know, the people make it so easy now. Just say this little prayer, you know, ask Jesus in your heart, and then now you're a child of God. You can never lose it, you know, and. But if God says that he calls you fishers of men, yeah. then we do play the role in bringing them to that power. So how would we bring them to well, the power? a fisherman uses bait. He uses wisdom. He might use different kinds of bait for different kinds of fish. You know, uh, so sometimes when you're, you're, one time they threw out a net, and then when they drug it in, they had some good fish and a bad fish, and they threw out the bad, and they brought the good. Mm-hmm. You know, so, yes. Here's what I'm Along those lines, here's what I'm gleaning from this now. I'm kind of having a paradigm shift on yeah. of, of apologetics, but it's like the tip, the, the, the paperwork has prerequisites. So yeah. do the work, make sure you've got those things squared away. And then th- the way to, to um, help somebody to, to plant the seed really yeah. is, is Satisfy the prerequisites, get that squared away, and by virtue of the fact of doing that, I assume you 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 into the thing right. anyway, day in and day out. Yeah. Getting, for example, halfway to the depth of the knowledge you you've got in all this stuff, 
So that when, to the question over here, somebody says this scripture means this, um, then we've got the Holy Spirit on us, we've got the, 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 the time spent, the work done into this, that we're then prepared to, you know, and, and say a prayer and get the, you know, ask for some guidance to, yeah. to present the, the position that we see yeah. being conveyed in that, in that particular verse. And then that's it. Plant yeah. the seed yeah. and, and, you know, answer questions. But that's what I'm getting out of this. Yeah. Which is it, it, the what I'm getting out of this. Paradise. Okay, but the word has to be an anointed, you know. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Would you like to go first? You're welcome to do it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, my thing is, have you challenged your friends that don't believe to read the Bible as if it were any other book? No, no, because I'm afraid to, because I don't I don't have I don't understand it. Number one, honestly, I haven't put the work into it. From start to finish. That is a powerful thing, right? Yeah. The thing is, as you start to read it from start to finish, if you've never done so. You start to see life play out. You see how the judicial systems form. You see how the different religions start to play out, and it all starts to come together. So if you can get them to do that reading, just like they're reading another book, say so just read it like it's a book you're going to pick up at the library. Right. Yeah, yeah. It starts to play out. Yeah. And as they start to read and realize this is life, then it starts to kind of turn their wheels. Yeah, so, and, and I get that. I get that in my head. But but at the same time, I I and like I said earlier, part of this is to help me convince myself. And so yeah. I wanted to have because I, I saw a, a thing on TV once years ago, and it was it was a documentary about the Mormons, and there was this woman truly moved by receiving whatever the Mormons have. I'm completely ignorant of it. They're truly moved by that. And then I see the same thing over again in our church, week in, week out. Yeah. So I'm like. Okay, they're both equally moved. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how do I get the education so that I can say this is the yeah. only way and plant the seeds like I was trying to say earlier? Yeah. Well, so it starts with, with us individually, right? Yeah. So we have to do the work yeah. ourselves internally, understand it, yeah. so that we can then, um, and and I don't mean this in an argumentative way as far as defend. Defend can mean many things. Yeah. And they're similar. Um, well, I'm picking it up. So justify, vindicate, protect, guard, safeguard, all those things. Yeah. Um, the word of God. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so just simply having a conversation with someone and just whatever seed God's yeah. intended yeah. to be planted or not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we we just kind of mirror what the gospel says in regards to how we're supposed you to disciple different. people. Yeah, like, a, like Paul said, one sows, another reads, but it's God that gives you interest. I love your idea about, hey, here's the book of John. Just read that and let's talk about it and see what you think. You know, the word has power all by itself. You know, it, it will change people. But I know, you know? that so, it, go ahead. at one point in my life, when yeah. I was, like, you know, 13 years old, I tried reading the Bible. And I, I put it down and never picked it up again because yeah. it just confused me and overwhelmed yeah. me and I didn't and understand any of it. And <laughs> okay. so, so there, said, so, the natural man understands not the things of God. You, you know, uh, you, you just, first, Psalm 1, blessed is a man, walketh not in the counsel of the God, that nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both night and day. And he shall be like a tree that is planted by the river of the water, bring us forth his fruit. You have to slow down. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think we all are, I'm going to speak for myself. I came in looking for a formula and a shortcut and, yes. you know, wanting to have, a, like, a script so I can cut. <laughs> But I, now I know yeah. it's got to come. Absolutely. And I got to have it here to here, and there's no, there is no shortcut. And all we do is plant seeds and live by example yeah. and be the person that he wants us to be so, and try. You know? yeah. so that's really what I'm going to get yeah. right now. That we just plant yeah. a seed. And like, I'm, luckily, my college is, uh, is and my one of my dead end classes, like that. Um, they use the Bible as a history book. So yeah. one of my friends yeah. was struggling with understanding the Bible, and I was like, no, just look at it like a history book, because literally yeah. what it is is a history book. 
And she was like, oh, that makes more sense. And she was Buddhist. She's still Buddhist, but she was Buddhist. And we sat down and for like an hour and a half, we were comparing religions like, hey, what about this? How do you believe in this? How is this? Buddhism is like a lifestyle. It's not like a religion. And that's what I learned out of that. And I was like, no, yeah. Christianity is this, and this is how we do it. And maybe I planted a seed. And was sure. like, hey, this is what it is. But it was all through the fact that my yeah. dad in class had brought the Bible as a yeah. history, history, history yeah. book. Yeah. There's so, re- yeah, and there's reference material out there as well that you can, you know, look at the Bible and also kind of understand historically, culturally, you know, all the things that were happening that kind of make the content of the Bible make more sense. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Historical context. Right. Right. But there's other books too. Like yeah. Traveling. Sure. I mean, the, the Exodus right. Bible. Yeah. There's one yeah. about. Able and pain, too. It's right. an actual book. My kids right. read it like in their English class. And that's a powerful story. I mean, boy, there's a lot of lessons. But there's other books out there that relate to the Bible, too, that yeah. I don't think people even realize when they read. Yeah. So there's two books that um, CLI uses, uh-huh. um, and one specific to the New Testament and one specific to the Old Testament. And, um, I highly, highly recommend. Do you know what they, they are? are? Yeah, I do. I, I, uh, yeah. Tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get like, it as I, I waited too long. To yeah, no, this. yeah. Um, so um, we can we can talk. I have them too. Okay. Yeah, I have I have both of them. Okay. I just graduated. And they yeah, also have seal of classes on the New Testament and on the Old Testament. They do. Well, well and that's how we all got started. Even, even learning classes, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we took the New Testament. Survey because it mm-hmm. he just plowed through it. And, mm-hmm. I, I think mean, it was part two, even. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, was it fat? Like, you were there. No, no, we were, we were all in there. Yeah, okay. We took yeah. the Old Testament first and then we took the New Testament. Yeah, so good. Yes, sir. So, oh, I think it's helping with this. So, you get somebody or they get themselves the curiosity to look into this. We talked about you know you got you got to have I think I have a phrase but you got to have your heart open yeah by God so clearly people have read this in hotel rooms and other people have read this on time like you and got way late so what's the difference well a lot of it's prayer okay so uh, you, say again a lot of it's prayer okay. Um, you know, my mother in law was just a praying lady, and, <laughs> and uh, like I said, she was on her knees all the time. And, and, and I was having, you know, see, I grew up in a family that had all kinds of generational curses. My dad was an alcoholic, drug addict. Uh, I mean, there's so many bad things. I had three brothers, and they all we all had the same problems. You so know? There are some people out there that are that are wholly dependent upon others, strangers are not praying for them, get their brain. And are open to receive it. Are you saying, you know, there's a, no, what I'm saying? I'm just yeah. to, I just I didn't know what I'm trying to ask. I'm just, I'm just yeah, yeah. I got a question. Like, it, like the point that I'm prayer. Like, did my grandmother's prayers yeah. open it? Make me I mean, is that, yeah. finally right. understand the Bible when I picked it up this time. Right. The, my grandmother's prayers have saved me many times in this yeah. world. Yeah. Kept me alive. So that's what I said. Kept me alive. Yeah. <laughs> I said, did anybody get anything today? I promise you. I promise you. Encountering the New Testament and encountering the Old Testament. You got the way you were in it's kind of what I spoke today is an anointed word. You're going to wake up, you're going to have dreams, you're going to think about them, you're going to be walking down. Let me pray for everybody. Father God, I just ask you to touch the people. Father, just reach down from your throne of glory, Lord, and touch every part. You want to work through people, Lord. His hearts are really to you, Father. Yield every person's heart to you, Father. You reach them mightily. Thank you, Father. says, the eyes of the sovereign Lord search over the whole earth, seeking someone through whom he can show himself strong. Work through this group of people, Father. Show yourself powerful in every act. In Jesus' name, amen.